Part two of chapter five of book one of the wealth of nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part two of chapter five of book one of the real and nominal price of commodities, or of their price in labor, and their price in money. In the progress of industry, commercial nations have found it convenient to coin several different metals into money, gold for larger payments, silver for purchases of moderate value, and copper or some other coarse metal for those of still smaller consideration. They have always, however, considered one of those metals as more peculiarly the measure of value than any of the other two and this preference seems generally to have been given to the metal which they happened first to make use of as the instrument of commerce. Having once begun to use it as their standard, which they must have done when they had no other money, they have generally continued to do so even when the necessity was not the same. The Romans are said to have had nothing but copper money till within five years before the first Punic War, when they first began to coin silver. Copper, therefore, appears to have continued always the measure of value in that republic. At Rome, all accounts appear to have been kept, and the value of all estates to have been computed, either in asses or in sesterti. The as was always the denomination of a copper coin. The word sestertius signifies two asses and a half. Though the sestertius, therefore, was originally a silver coin, its value was estimated in copper. At Rome, one who owed a great deal of money was said to have a great deal of other people's copper. The northern nations who established themselves upon the ruins of the Roman Empire seem to have had silver money from the first beginning of their settlements, and not to have known either gold or copper coins for several ages thereafter. There were silver coins in England in the time of the Saxons, but there was little gold coin till the time of Edward III, nor any copper till that of James I of Great Britain. In England, therefore, and for the same reason, I believe, in all other modern nations of Europe, all accounts are kept, and the value of all goods and of all estates is generally computed in silver. And when we mean to express the amount of a person's fortune, we seldom mention the number of guineas, but the number of pounds sterling which we suppose would be given for it. Originally, in all countries, I believe, a legal tender of payment could be made only in the coin of that metal which was peculiarly considered as the standard or measure of value. In England, gold was not considered as a legal tender for a long time after it was coined into money. The proportion between the values of gold and silver money was not fixed by any public law or proclamation, but was left to be settled by the market. If a debtor offered payment in gold, the creditor might either reject such payment altogether, or accept of it at such a valuation of the gold as he and his debtor could agree upon. Copper is not at present a legal tender, except in the chains of the smaller silver coins. In this state of things, the distinction between the metal which was the standard and that which was not the standard was something more than a nominal distinction. In process of time, and as people became gradually more familiar with the use of the different metals and coin, and consequently better acquainted with the proportion between their respective values, it has, in most countries, I believe, been found convenient to ascertain this proportion, and to declare by a public law that a guinea, for example, of such a weight and fineness should exchange for one and twenty shillings or be a legal tender for a debt of that amount. In this state of things, and during the continuance of any one regulated proportion of this kind, the distinction between the metal, which is the standard, and that which is not the standard, becomes little more than a nominal distinction. In consequence of any change, however, in this regulated proportion, this distinction becomes, or at least seems to become, something more than nominal again. If the regulated value of a guinea, for example, was either reduced to twenty or raised to two and twenty shillings, all accounts being kept, and almost all obligation for debt being expressed in silver money, the greater part of payments could, in either case, be made with the same quantity of silver money as before, but would require very different quantities of gold money, a greater in the one case, and a smaller in the other. Silver would appear to be more invariable in its value than gold. Silver would appear to measure the value of gold, and gold would not appear to measure the value of silver. The value of gold would seem to depend upon the quantity of silver which it would exchange for, and the value of silver would not seem to depend upon the quantity of gold which it would exchange for. This difference, however, would be altogether owing to the custom of keeping accounts, and of expressing the amount of all great and small sums rather in silver than in gold money. 
One of Mr. Drummond's notes for five and twenty, or fifty guineas, would, after an alteration of this kind, be still payable with five and twenty, or fifty guineas, in the same manner as before. It would, after such an alteration, be payable with the same quantity of gold as before, but with very different quantities of silver. In the payment of such a note, gold would appear to be more invariable in its value than silver. Gold would appear to measure the value of silver, and silver would not appear to measure the value of gold. If the custom of keeping accounts and of expressing promissory notes and other obligations for money in this manner should ever become general, gold, and not silver, would be considered as the metal which was peculiarly the standard or measure of value. In reality, during the continuance of any one regulated proportion between the respective values of the different metals and coin, the value of the most precious metal regulates the value of the whole coin. Twelve copper pence contain half a pound avoir de poise of copper, of not the best quality, which, before it is coined, is seldom worth seven pence in silver. But as, by the regulation, twelve such pence are ordered to exchange for a shilling, they are in the market considered as worth a shilling, and a shilling can at any time be had for them. Even before the late reformation of the gold coin of Great Britain, the gold, that part of it at least which circulated in London and its neighborhood, was in general less degraded below its standard weight than the greater part of the silver. One and twenty worn and defaced shillings, however, were considered as equivalent to a guinea, which perhaps indeed was worn and defaced too, but seldom so much so. The late regulations have brought the gold coin as near, perhaps, to its standard weight as it is possible to bring the current coin of any nation, and the order to receive no gold at the public offices but by weight is likely to preserve it so as long as that order is enforced. The silver coin still continues in the same worn and degraded state as before the reformation of the cold coin. In the market, however, one and twenty shillings of this degraded silver coin are still considered as worth a guinea of this excellent gold coin. The reformation of the gold coin has evidently raised the value of the silver coin which can be exchanged for it. In the English mint, a pound weight of gold is coined into forty-four guineas and a half, which at one and twenty shillings the guinea is equal to forty-six pounds, fourteen shillings and sixpence. An ounce of such gold coin, therefore, is worth three pounds, seventeen shillings and ten pence halfpenny in silver. In England no duty or seigneurage is paid upon the coinage, and he who carries a pound weight or an ounce weight of standard gold bullion to the mint gets back a pound weight or an ounce weight of gold and coin, without any deduction. Three pounds seventeen shillings and ten pence halfpenny an ounce, therefore, is said to be the mint price of gold in England, or the quantity of gold coin which the mint gives in return for standard gold bullion. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the price of standard gold bullion in the market had, for many years, been upwards of three pounds eighteen shillings, sometimes three pounds nineteen shillings, and very frequently four pounds an ounce. That sum, it is probable, in the worn and degraded gold coin, seldom containing more than an ounce of standard gold. Since the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard gold bullion seldom exceeds three pounds seventeen shillings seven pence an ounce. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the market price was always more or less above the mint price. Since that reformation, the market price has been constantly below the mint price. But that market price is the same whether it is paid in gold or in silver coin. The late reformation of the gold coin, therefore, has raised not only the value of the gold coin, but likewise that of the silver coin in proportion to gold bullion, and probably too in proportion to all other commodities though the price of the greater part of other commodities being influenced by so many other causes the rise in the value of either gold or silver coin in proportion to them may not be so distinct and sensible in the english mint a pound weight of standard silver bullion is coined into sixty-two shillings containing in the same manner a pound weight of standard silver five shillings and two pence an ounce therefore is said to be the mint price of silver in england or the quantity of silver coin which the mint gives in return for standard silver bullion. Before the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard silver bullion was, upon different occasions, five shillings and fourpence, five shillings and fivepence, five shillings and sixpence, five shillings and sevenpence, and very often five shillings and eightpence an ounce. Five shillings and sevenpence, however, seems to have been the most common price. Since the reformation of the gold coin, the market price of standard silver bullion has fallen occasionally to five shillings and threepence, five shillings and fourpence, and five shillings and fivepence an ounce, which last price it has scarce ever exceeded. 
Though the market price of silver bullion has fallen considerably since the reformation of the gold coin, it has not fallen so low as the mint price. In the proportion between the different metals in the English coin, as copper is rated very much above its real value, so silver is rated somewhat below it. In the market of Europe, in the French coin, and in the Dutch coin, an ounce of fine gold exchanges for about fourteen ounces of fine silver. In the English coin, it exchanges for about fifteen ounces, that is, for more silver than it is worth, according to the common estimation of Europe. But as the price of copper in bars is not, even in England, raised by the high price of copper in English coin, so the price of silver in bullion is not sunk by the low rate of silver in English coin. Silver in bullion still preserves its proper proportion to gold, for the same reason that copper in bars preserves its proper proportion to silver. Upon the reformation of the silver coin, in the reign of William the Third, the price of silver bullion still continued to be somewhat above the mint price. Mr. Locke imputed this high price to the permission of exporting silver bullion, and to the prohibition of exporting silver coin. This permission of exporting, he said, rendered the demand for silver bullion greater than the demand for silver coin. But the number of people who want silver coin for the common uses of buying and selling at home is surely much greater than that of those who want silver bullion, either for the use of exportation or for any other use. There subsists at present a like permission of exporting gold bullion and a like prohibition of exporting gold coin, and yet the price of gold bullion has fallen below the mint price. But in the English coin, silver was then, in the same manner as now, underrated in proportion to gold, and the gold coin, which at that time too was not supposed to require any reformation, regulated then, as well as now, the real value of the whole coin. As the reformation of the silver coin did not then reduce the price of silver bullion to the mint price, it is not very probable that a like reformation will do so now. Were the silver coin brought back as near to its standard weight as the gold, a guinea, it is probable, would, according to the present proportion, exchange for more silver and coin than it would purchase in bullion. The silver coin containing its full standard weight, there would in this case be a profit in melting it down, in order, first, to sell the bullion for gold coin, and afterwards to exchange this gold coin for silver coin, to be melted down in the same manner. Some alteration in the present proportion seems to be the only method of preventing this inconveniency. The inconveniency, perhaps, would be less if silver was rated in the coin as much above its proper proportion to gold as it is at present rated below it, provided it was at the same time enacted that silver should not be a legal tender for more than the change of a guinea, in the same manner as copper is not a legal tender for more than the change of a shilling. No creditor could, in this case, be cheated in consequence of the high valuation of silver and coin, as no creditor can at present be cheated in consequence of the high valuation of copper. The bankers only would suffer by this regulation. When a run comes upon them, they sometimes endeavor to gain time by paying in sixpences, and they would be precluded by this regulation from this discreditable method of evading immediate payment. They would be obliged, in consequence, to keep at all times in their coffers a greater quantity of cash than at present. And though this might, no doubt, be a considerable inconveniency to them, it would, at the same time, be a considerable security to their creditors. Three pounds, seventeen shillings, and tenpence halfpenny, the mint price of gold, certainly does not contain, even in our present excellent gold coin, more than an ounce of standard gold, and it may be thought, therefore, should not purchase more standard bullion. But gold in coin is more convenient than gold in bullion, and though in England the coinage is free, yet the gold which is carried in bullion to the mint can seldom be returned in coin to the owner till after a delay of several weeks. In the present hurry of the mint it could not be returned till after a delay of several months. This delay is equivalent to a small duty, and renders gold in coin somewhat more valuable than an equal quantity of gold in bullion. If, in the English coin, silver was rated according to its proper proportion to gold, the price of silver bullion would probably fall below the mint price, even without any reformation of the silver coin. The value even of the present worn and defaced silver coin being regulated by the value of the excellent gold coin for which it can be changed. A small seigneurage, or duty upon the coinage of both gold and silver, would probably increase still more the superiority of those metals in coin above an equal quantity of either of them in bullion. The coinage would, in this case, increase the value of the metal coined in proportion to the extent of this small duty, for the same reason that the fashion increases the value of plate in proportion to the price of that fashion. 
the superiority of coin above bullion would prevent the melting down of the coin and would discourage its exportation if upon any public exigency it should become necessary to export the coin the greater part of it would soon return again of its own accord abroad it could sell only for its weight in bullion at home it would buy more than that weight there would be a profit therefore in bringing it home again in france a seigniorage of about eight per cent is imposed upon the coinage and the french coin when exported is said to return home again of its own accord the occasional fluctuations in the market price of gold and silver bullion arise from the same causes as the like fluctuations in that of all other commodities the frequent loss of those metals from various accidents by sea and by land the continual waste of them in gilding and plating in lace and embroidery in the wear and tear of coin and in that of plate require in all countries which possess no mines of their own a continual importation in order to repair this loss and this waste the merchant importers like all other merchants we may believe endeavour as well as they can to suit their occasional importations to what they judge is likely to be the immediate demand with all their attention however they sometimes overdo the business and sometimes underdo it when they import more bullion than is wanted rather than incur the risk and trouble of exporting it again they are sometimes willing to sell a part of it for something less than the ordinary or average price when on the other hand they import less than is wanted they get something more than this price but when under all those occasional fluctuations the market price either of gold or silver bullion continues for several years together steadily and constantly either more or less above or more or less below the mint price we may be assured that this steady and constant either superiority or inferiority of price is the effect of something in the state of the coin which at that time renders a certain quantity of coin either of more value or of less value than the precise quantity of bullion which it ought to contain the constancy and steadiness of the effect supposes a proportional constancy and steadiness in the cause the money of any particular country is at any particular time and place more or less an accurate measure or value according as the current coin is more or less exactly agreeable to its standard or contains more or less exactly the precise quantity of pure gold or pure silver which it ought to contain if in england for example forty-four guineas and a half contained exactly a pound weight of standard gold or eleven ounces of fine gold and one ounce of alloy the gold coin of england would be as accurate a measure of the actual value of goods at any particular time and place as the nature of the thing would admit but if by rubbing and wearing forty-four guineas and a half generally contain less than a pound weight of standard gold the diminution however being greater in some pieces than in others the measure of value comes to be liable to the same sort of uncertainty to which all other weights and measures are commonly exposed as it rarely happens that these are exactly agreeable to their standard the merchant adjusts the price of his goods as well as he can not to what those weights and measures ought to be but to what upon an average he finds by experience they actually are in consequence of a like disorder in the coin the price of goods comes in the same manner to be adjusted not to the quantity of pure gold or silver which the coin ought to contain but to that which upon an average it is found by experience it actually does contain by the money price of goods it is to be observed i understand always the quantity of pure gold or silver for which they are sold without any regard to the denomination of the coin six shillings and eightpence for example in the time of edward i i consider as the same money price with a pound sterling in the present times because it contained as nearly as we can judge the same quantity of pure silver end of book one chapter five part two